Thank you, Matt, for that kind welcome. Um, uh, wow, there's a crowd here tonight. Um, I, yeah, I'm uh, Herb Malinoff, and I'm, uh, I'm a doctor, and we're, I'm, my title of my talk is A Doctor's Opinion. It's not my opinion. And there's quite a crowd here tonight. I've been giving this talk for a while, uh, and I, my wife says I had to dress up tonight because I understand I'm being videotaped, so i got to dress up and look good. Now, I told the video I was to aim low because we're talking five foot seven here, so don't, no. all right. So um, we're going to talk about the doctor's opinion in alcohol in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I've given this talk for a number of years, and there's quite a crowd here tonight. I remember giving this talk in the year 2000. It was actually election night 2000 when, uh, if you remember that election, it was a contested thing, Al Gore running against George Bush. And, and I, I, I spoke to about six people, and I was one of them. <laughs> Everyone was home watching TV. I was, got in there as quickly as I could to go home and turn on the TV and get disappointed. But um, <laughs> I like to, I'm glad there's a clock. I like to look at the clock when I talk. I'm looking at, just so you know this, I, I like to watch the clock, not to see what time it is, but to give those of you who worry about it a sense of optimism that I really care what time it is. Uh, and uh, I only have about six or seven, 635 slides to show you, and we're going to get through them quickly. I'm going to try to end around, uh, I don't know, by midnight. If I'm not done by midnight, Matt will usually give me the high sign. Um, I, I, I got a few things to say. Uh, that's me. Um, now I got a whole. I, I don't stand behind a podium for obvious reasons. I, I, I get lost behind a podium. So this goes on. Can you hear me? Ah, good. Um, that's me, and my wife will tell you that I'm overeducated for my level of intelligence. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, I don't have any commercial interests, so I don't get any money from pharmacy companies or, or institutions or anything, and that explains my cheap sport coat. Uh, and tonight, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about what, where my talk fix, fits in. Okay, Dr. Silkworth is this physician we're going to talk about. Now, have, has anyone here heard me talk before? I can't imagine anyone want to hear me twice. So if you, if you die, if you, I don't, not much to do tonight, I guess. I hear me talk twice. Oh. Dr. Silkworth, and my talk fits into the, into the, a little bit of the history of AA, a little bit of the science or the biology of what we know about addiction, alcoholism, uh, a little bit about some practical information, but there will be other talks in this series that are really better than mine that you're going to want to come back. So I want you to come back and hear Dr. Christensen. He's on your schedule. When Dr. Christensen will talk about the biology of addiction. I think next week or there's going to be a panel of members of AA speaking, which is the experience of actual members of AA who give their own uh, perspective on recovery. There's also going to be a couple other talks about the history of AA. So Jim B. Jim Balmer is going to give a talk about the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to take elements from those areas and talk about them myself and, and try not to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, belabor their talks as well. So uh, relate Dr. Silver to the modern neurobiology of addiction, what we know about it in the year 2011. Uh, I want to identify uh, um, therapy for alcoholism as Dr. Silver's opinion would promote therapy for it. And what, how does it relate to Dr. Silver's opinion? Above all else, I want to have time for questions. But the most important thing I do when I talk is this. I don't want to be boring. So if I'm boring, raise your hand, snore loudly or something. I, don't want, I hate boring lectures. And I don't, I don't want to bore any of the gene. I want to, there's a couple of disclaimers. I, I don't pretend to be an expert on the big book uh, or Dr. Silver's opinion, although I think I am. I'm really not an expert. So if I say something that doesn't jive with what you know about the big book or what Dr. Silver says, Take what you can use and, and just file the rest or, or discard the rest. So I'm not, I don't want to offend the sensibilities of any of the advanced thinkers in this room. So take what you can use. This is just my own little uh, 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 distillation of what I've learned over a few years of looking at Dr. Soker. So I want to start out by talking a little bit about uh, alcoholism. Does anybody recognize that picture who hasn't heard me talk before? That's yep. Edward Degas. He was an artist of the, uh, of the late... 19th century, early 20th century. He was, a, he was an expert at depicting human emotion, human face, facial expression, 
And this is a woman, this is called the absinthe, which is the absinthe drinker. And this is a woman sitting in a, in, this is the, in the Belle Epoque, the gay 90s, in the 1890s. She's sitting in a cafe in France. Look at that expression. That's a, an amazingly accurate description or depiction of someone who has alcoholism. This woman's sitting by herself. The crowd is, it's, it's, it's a, a gay, festive crowd in this place. And this is a, one, of those, one of those cafes. And she's sitting in front of a glass of absinthe. And she looks like that. And if you know anyone or if you have suffered from the disease of alcoholism, that's kind of what you're looking at. That's, that's someone who's sort of disconnected from her surroundings and she's not happy. That's alcoholism. So let's talk a little bit about alcoholism in, 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 as far as what we know about it. We'll talk about doc, who is Dr. Silkworth and so on. So alcoholism involves people drinking alcohol, obviously. You don't get alcoholism from eating ice cream cones. You get it from drinking. So uh, people, 90% of adults will have tried alcohol at some point in their lives. There are 10% of adults in this country, this is America, who have, don't drink alcohol for uh, religious reasons, for uh, health reasons, for uh, uh, they, they don't want to drink because their parents were alcoholic. Those are, so 10% don't drink. 90% of the people drink. Out of those, there are about 60 to 65% of the current adult population drinks alcohol once in a while regularly. Some 40% will have temporary problems with alcohol. They'll get a bad hangover. If you ever had a bad hangover, if you've ever uh, gotten a speeding ticket while drinking, and you know, that's a temporary problem. People will misuse alcohol, 10 to 20% of the people will say abuse. That's misuse of alcohol. For example, drinking alcohol when, when someone's pregnant, that's misuse. Underage drinking, that's, that's another example of that. Uh, uh, you know, getting toxic from alcohol at a fraternity party, that's misuse of alcohol. Drinking alcohol to go to sleep at night, that's misuse of alcohol actually. It's not meant to be that way. Uh, drinking alcohol to kill pain, that's another misuse of alcohol. So about 10 to 20% of the people who drink are not using it for the right reason. And what's the right reason to use alcohol? Get a buzz. <laughs> See me after the meeting. <laughs> that's we're gonna talk. That's that's the three to twenty the ten percent who have dependency. And you guys keep and you'll see. I'm glad you said it because because most people who drink alcohol don't do it for that. And people who are alcoholic don't understand that. People who are not alcoholic uh, don't understand. We'll, we'll understand that in a minute. Now I'm sure there's a few people with, who are in recovery in this room. I don't have to identify yourselves. Are there any non-alcoholics in this room? If you're not an alcoholic, raise your hand. Non-alcoholics. Okay. You're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way, right? <laughs> All right, it's not their fault. Now, people who are non-alcoholic will start to understand what I'm saying. The, alcoholic in, the alcoholics in the audience will get their, will get their turn later. So 3 to 10% will have what's called dependence or actual alcohol addiction. In fact, if you want to look at the actual numbers, at any moment in time, about 10 to 11 percent of the adult population in this country are alcoholic or have some form of alcoholism. So, uh, but of course, alcoholism can be mild, moderate, terrible, and horrible. So, but about 11 percent of the people walking around will have alcoholism. Now, the problem is that alcoholism is. This is an article from the Journal of the American Medical Association from a while ago. Addiction poorly understood by clinicians. Experts say attitude, lack of knowledge, hinder treatment. Well, that's, this was from 2004. Nothing's changed in the past seven years, let me tell you. Uh, clinicians still have a very poor understanding of alcoholism. If you go to your doctor, he or she may not understand that you are in recovery, and he or she may not understand what alcoholism is. They may learn about it for about one hour in medical school, and medical school is four years long. Uh, and and then, so most people regard addiction as a moral problem. Only 1% of the medical school curriculum, that's generous. It's really not 1%, it's less than that. No one adequately screens for it. Oh, that's getting a bit better. People are starting to screen. Why? Because now you can get paid to screen. <laughs> the insurance companies will actually pay me to screen patients for alcoholism, something I've been doing for free for 20 years. Now I can get paid for it. <laughs> well, the, uh, many physicians believe in it. Yeah, right, thank you. <laughs> I make money the old-fashioned way. I bill Blue Cross. <laughs> Believe interventions are ineffective. So uh, clinicians, physicians, therapists, counselors, psychiatrists have had a lot of trouble with people like us for a long, long time. Okay, this is who? That's Silkworth. That's Dr. Silkworth. This is the doctor who loved alcoholics. Dr. Silkworth uh, is a hero in, in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Why? Well, he was a man, uh, he was born in the late uh, 1800s, and he studied uh, at Princeton University, went to medical school at New York University. And he did his internship in what's called neuropsychiatry. They didn't have real psychiatry or real neurology at that time, but he became an expert in uh, alcoholism through his own experience. They didn't teach him anything about this. Because, uh, why did he do this? Because it was the depression. He lost all of his money in the depression. He made some investments in 
uh, nursing, some type of a nursing home arrangement. He lost all his money in the depression. He was working for $40 a week at a place called Towns Hospital. So uh, he was a psychiatrist. They called him a psychiatrist, although he's really the, the treating neurologist at Towns Hospital. Now, Towns Hospital wasn't a hospital. It's on, anybody know New York City? It was on Central Park West in New York City. It was a, a, it was a, it was a, a brownstone. It was a, a three or four story brownstone and they treated rich alcoholics. So people with lots of money could go there and be treated. Now, what was treatment? It's called drying out. They, he detoxed alcoholics week after week, month after month. It's estimated he treated 40,000 alcoholics in the course of his career. Starting in the late 1920s, uh, he treated perhaps 40,000 of us. And uh, he learned about alcoholism not from books, not from journals, not from uh, anything he uh, uh, discovered. He learned about it through his own experience. So uh, he thought alcoholism was a twofold illness, mind and body. And he gave Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, step one, which we'll see in a few minutes is the problem. Uh, and he published in the Journal of the Lancet in 1989. Now, uh, this is the book where we're talking, we say the doctor's opinion, it appears in this book. Now, this is a copy of the letter dated July 27, 1938. So uh, we're talking uh, 73 years ago. Uh, uh, Dr. Silkworth wrote this letter, uh, and he said uh, four years ago, 1934, he attended a patient by the name of William G. Wilson. We know that as Bill W. Right. Uh, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, he was an alcoholic of the type I had come to regard as hopeless. So Dr. Silkworth came to regard certain alcoholics to be cared for as hopeless. And Wilson was one of these hopeless alcoholics. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning the possible means of recovery. And we'll see what that is later on in my talk. What are those ideas he acquired? As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his now his new conception to other alcoholics impressing upon them they must do likewise with still others. So this is kind of like Amway without the money. You gotta treat someone and they gotta treat someone and they gotta treat someone. So it's Amway without the money. I personally know 30 of these cases who are types upon which other methods have failed completely. So this is a big deal for a physician who's cared for alcoholics month in, month out, who's seen failure after failure after tragedy, and he writes about this in his opinion in the book. If you haven't read it, read it I urge you to read the full doctor's opinion. He talks about the, 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 the blameless children. He talks about the wives. The, the, he talks about the screaming delirium of these men. And to do this week after week, month after month, and to see someone recover and have 30 others recover, as a physician, I find that remarkable. That would just be an amazing thing. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group. These, these events may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. Well, the annals of alcoholism are pretty long. How long have we known about alcoholism? Do you know how far back it goes? 5,000 years. If you look at up, there's, this is the big book. There's the big, big book in the book of Proverbs. Another wise man, Solomon, wrote a, a whole piece about alcoholism in the book of Proverbs. And you can read that. He described alcoholism thousands of years ago. So this is Silkworth signs his letter and, and, and is really endorsing this means of recovery. He says means of recovery. We'll talk about those means later. Now, Silkworth... Uh, knew this empirically. He didn't come up with this idea by, again, studying and reading books. He knew that the solution to alcoholism depending on, depends on how you look at the problem. That was true 78 years ago. It's true today. So people have looked at, at people who have alcoholism through various different lenses. Or there's, we'll see what those lenses are and see why those lenses are cloudy and you're not looking at the right problem. You can't really identify a solution to alcoholism until you really know what alcoholism is. And up until this time, up until Silkworth's time, how did we look at alcoholism? It was a moral failing. They're called, these were, if you heard William White here, anybody here hear Bill White talk a few, uh, about a month ago? He was wonderfully, much better than me, much taller than me too, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but he gave a talk where he described it as inebriates. Inebriates are people who can't control themselves. So alcoholics were considered to be weak-willed people. They were considered to be moral failures. They're, and all these, they're considered to be something slightly above criminals. Uh, and that was the viewpoint, uh, the medical and the social viewpoint of alcoholism. Now, that's changed a bit since then, but some people still cling to that. Uh, it's been about 11 years when it's really, it's, it hasn't been possible to talk about alcoholism as anything other than an illness. About 11 years ago, things changed. We'll see that at the end. So, the problem that you are describing determines the solution. So, the solution that we offer for alcoholism in 2011, and the one that Bill Wilson discovered when he was in his third treatment at Towns Hospital in 1934. That solution doesn't make any sense to anyone unless you understand the problem. And there's still people today that are very raucous in their, in their defense of their, uh, 
ability to try to drink socially and so on, even though they are alcoholics. So you'll see that the solution we offer doesn't make a bit of sense unless you understand the problem. So the next part of my talk is going to be try to identify what did Silkworm look at the problem? How did he see the problem versus how did everyone else in the world see the problem? So uh, here's the problem not. So let's first say, what is not the problem? So the problem is not lack of willpower. That was, again, that's a big one. So if you've ever suffered from alcoholism or another form of addiction, let's just say, for example, cigarette smoking, like the people I saw in front before this talk. If you're a cigarette smoker, you might think that you're just dealing with a bad habit, and the solution is just to bear down and use your willpower. How about lack of moral character? That's another problem that you might think you have if you're an alcoholic. I have lack of moral, moral willpower, lack of moral character, lack of understanding or education. So come to lectures and you'll solve your alcohol problem. You'll learn about it and solve the problem. How's that work for anyone in this room? You try to learn about your alcoholism. All right, so alcoholic, you might think you have an alcohol problem. If you be alcoholic or addicted, you might think you have an alcohol problem. And we'll see how that kind of falls apart under some closer scrutiny. So right now, what we're going to identify is what the problem is not, and then we can sort of bear down a little bit in the final two and a half hours of my talk about what the problem really is. All right? So, lack of willpower. Let's say we're weak. Weak people uh, are, are the heavy drinkers. They can't, can, I can quit drinking. Why can't you? So the people who raised your hands before as non-alcoholics will look at people with alcoholism and say, well, listen, I, can, I stop when I have two drinks. Why can't you? Why can't you control yourself? Lack of willpower. So here's you should not go to the bars. You should uh, avoid your friends who drink. You should go, don't go into a liquor store and think about baseball, and you won't have to drink. That, that, you know, it might work in another context as well, but you know, this, is, um, uh, this is the solution for someone who thinks their problem is just lack of willpower. Just so exert your willpower. So let's look at some individuals who suffer from alcoholism. This is, anyone know who that is? That's Mickey Mantle. Well, people my age here, that's Mickey Mantle. He suffered from alcoholism after he died after a second liver transplant. Uh, was he a weak-willed individual? Not so much. You know, he played with tremendous pain throughout the last two-thirds of his career, really. So nothing about Mickey Mantle speaks of a, a man of weak will. Uh, well, how about this guy here? Anyone know him? There's an indomitable series, if ever there was one. Lack of willpower? We don't think so. He got it England through World War II. Well, clear, very clearly, was an alcoholic. Drank whiskey, or drank well over a fifth of brandy a day throughout World War II. Uh, so lack of willpower was never this gentleman's problem. How about this guy? You know who this guy is? <laughs> who? <laughs> well, that's 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 Buzz A or Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> he put the flag on the moon. Buzz has been sober about 29 years now. This is the guy that put the flag on the moon. That's the flag. That's the moon. That's Buzz. Uh, weak willpower. <laughs> I'm not sure why they called him Buzz, but he didn't pay it. but uh, I, I, uh, I I met someone who's I met the man who sponsors Buzz in AA, and uh, Buzz is written very eloquently about his own alcoholism. Now, is he will weak willed? Is he? Uh, you don't get to put the flag on the moon by being any sort of a, a weakling, right? Uh, so those are three individuals with no shortage of willpower and yet suffering from alcoholism. So it would appear to me, and maybe to you too, that lack of willpower is really not the problem with alcoholics. There's something else going on. How about, uh, uh, if you, let's just say, if, if, this, if the problem is that you're a, a, a dumb, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't need the knowledge, if you need the knowledge about things, let's go to some lectures, let's read a book, let's look at the tapes and the videos of my talk, you can go online and get my video. Self-knowledge will heal this problem. How about self-knowledge uh, or intelligence? Well, uh, once again, power to control your mind, alcohol, natural self-hypnosis. Uh, well, that didn't work back then. Uh, self-knowledge doesn't work with an illness like alcoholism. So, of course, self-knowledge doesn't work with any other illness you can use, name either. Diabetes, self-knowledge about your diabetes doesn't fix diabetes. Knowledge of your high blood pressure doesn't fix that either. Knowledge you, you know, the, the steps you take to control your illness are what controls your illness. Uh, lack of knowledge. Let's look at Buzz again. <laughs> Buzz, Buzz has a degree in engineering. He also was a was a, a fighter pilot. He, again, not a, not a uh, an unintelligent man. This is a genius. This is a musical genius. Buzz Powell was known to be a genius uh, in terms of his musicianship. Uh, suffered from alcoholism and drug addiction. Anyone recognize this guy? Jackson Pollock, right, who said that? Well, we got some folks in here who know there are. Jackson Pollock, another genius, a certified genius, uh, an artistic genius, <coughs> died from alcoholism. Wow. Anybody know that? Awesome. Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas was a poet, not Bob Dylan, but Dylan Thomas died from alcoholism. Uh, again, genius, known to be a, a literary genius. So uh, g geniuses have suffered from alcoholism just like uh, us mere mortals. So uh, lack of knowledge or lack of intelligence doesn't appear to be 
the solution to the problem. Uh, how about if you think you have deep psychological problems? Maybe that's the problem with alcoholism. Maybe we're just crazy. <laughs> or maybe uh, we react that way sometimes, but alcoholism was thought for a long time to be characterized by psychological, deep psychological problems. And this, pr this took a long time to go away. In fact, it was only about 11 years ago that, that finally, finally, finally medicine sort of let go of this, this, this chew toy of, of deep psychological problems. That's not the problem. Why? Uh, if that's the problem, the solution is going to be counseling, it's going to be psychotherapy, sometimes lots of medication. Uh, none of these things have ever helped alcoholics that all much. Uh, anybody know who that is? Edmund Freud. Edmund Freud. Well, he's a, he's a psychologist. He invented the, the whole field of psychiatry. And sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, but this killed him. He died from addiction. He was a cocaine addict and a tobacco addict. And he died from head and neck cancer. He died from drug addiction. Uh, and he was a cocaine addict most of his adult life. So uh, having lots of psychological insights obviously didn't help Sigmund Freud. Uh, again, this guy here, you can't be, I don't think you can be any more psychologically healthy than this guy. They don't let you put the flag on the moon unless you pass some tests, right? So let's go back. Yeah, I like to use this man as, a, as, a, as, a, as an object lesson because if this man can be an alcoholic, anybody can be an alcoholic, okay? If, if Buzz Aldrin could be uh, an alcoholic, who can't, okay? All right, so. The, the, what we've decided so far is that all the insights in the world, whether you get them Freudian, whether you get them from lectures, whether you get them from reading self-help books. Anybody here read self-help books to treat their alcoholism? Anybody got a few of those keeping the self-help industry uh, alive? Reading self-help books is like, you know, it's, it, someone said it's like peeing in your pants on a street corner. You get a nice warm feeling temporarily. <laughs> and, then, and then the first wind blows and you're, uh, you're cold again. <laughs> Insight doesn't lead to any type of uh, help. Behavior change, as we know, and the whole science and, and the whole methods of recovery from alcoholism that we now have and addiction are based upon behavior change. We change behavior. So if you think lack of moral character is the problem, so we've, we've kind of dispensed with knowledge, we've dispensed with psychiatry, we've dispensed with willpower, how about character? Well, alcoholics may not be bad people, but they do a heck of a good imitation of them, don't they? Well, when they're out there you know, running over people and drunk, getting drunk and smashing the furniture and doing all the things we do. Uh, if there's some alcoholics in this room, we can count the broken marriages that have occurred because of, of our alcoholism. So maybe it's just a character flaw. Well, uh, if, you, if, if you think that's the problem, a character a flaw, well, the solution is going to be a solemn oath. We're going to go to church, better philosophy of life, organized religion, better code of morals. All of these things have never been shown to treat alcoholism to any great extent or success. Anyone know who that is? My idol. <laughs> My idol. <laughs> who, who said that? Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby. Well, Bing Crosby's playing a, a, a priest, and there's another priest. Well, this is just an example from a, from a Hollywood movie to show you that many, many men of the cloth, many ministers, priests, rabbis are themselves alcoholic. They go to specialized treatment centers for priests, ministers, and rabbis. So having good moral character and having lots of religious training doesn't protect you from alcoholism, sad to say. Well, then, as, as any, uh, if anybody went recovering a minister, you'll know that they very clearly say that their, their church couldn't help them, even though they, they tried, it didn't work. Uh, so if you think alcohol is the problem, because now we've dispensed with weak, dumb, crazy, and evil. We've dispensed with those as a likely culprit. How about alcohol? Maybe alcohol is the problem. Maybe drugs are the problem with drug addiction. So people will say that I have a drinking problem, I have a drug problem. You can't pick up a newspaper or read a magazine without hearing about so-and-so celebrity with her drug problem, with her drinking problem. Okay, so maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's just drugs and alcohol. And what's the solution? Stop drinking, stop using drugs, right? Anybody try that for their alcoholism? Anybody go, go get sober? I was talking to someone today in my office who wanted to quit smoking. And I had to indicate the difference between quitting smoking and becoming a non-smoker. It's the same thing between quitting drinking and becoming a sober alcoholic. They're not the same thing. And you know how to quit drinking real fast? Uh, go to sleep. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see the genius part here tonight. So the way, the way to quit drinking, if you want to quit drinking real fast, punch a police officer. You will quit drinking, guarantee you. And you will probably start drinking once you get out of jail. Uh, same thing with smoking. You want to quit your smoking? You want to become a non-smoker? Do you want to quit smoking? Punch a cop. You'll quit smoking. And coming out, you'll start smoking again. And if people here have been in the hospital or, or been locked up for a period of time will come out and, and be just as bad as they were. Why? Because when we get sober, we get restless, irritable, and discontent. We, alcoholics get filled up with resentment, fear, shame, and guilt. 
And this pushes alcoholism closer and closer, pushes us back to the drink. Uh, so what's the point? So here's the point. <laughs> that's me, that's the point. The point of this is, is that what I've gone through in the past 15 minutes is describing what society, individuals, families, and so on, look at the problem. And if you look at the problem through those lenses, you don't come up with the right solution. And the other side of that coin is the solution that's offered to you when you finally make it to your treatment center or your therapist or your doctor, the solution that's offered to you doesn't make any sense. It's like, why should I do that? I don't want to pray. I don't want to go to a meeting. I don't want to call a sponsor. My problem is alcohol. I pray, don't you understand? My case is different. My problem is just alcohol. Stop drinking and I'll be fine. Well, again and again, try that over and over and over. This becomes a fatal process as we'll see in a few minutes. So, alcohol problem versus what? Versus alcoholism. Big difference, huge difference. If you don't understand that difference and you be alcoholic, you're very likely to die from this illness because you can't get better unless you start to understand what the problem is. So what's the problem? This is where Silkworth comes in. Thank God for Silkworth. He was the first doctor, the first medical person to conceptualize alcoholism in terms of the mechanism. What's really going on? Now up until this time, a few individuals in the medical profession thought we were dealing with an illness. The guy who signed the Declaration of Independence, one of them, Dr. Benjamin Rush, going back to the, to the 7th to the 18th century, he thought alcoholism was a illness. But he didn't know anything, he didn't know anything beyond that. It might be an illness, but he didn't know anything about it. Silkworth said it's an illness characterized by two things, an allergy of the body and an obsession of the mind. What does he mean, allergy of the body? Now, anybody here drink alcohol and sneeze or get highs or anything? Some people do, but most alcoholics don't break out in hives or rashes or anything. What's he talking about, the allergy? We're not talking about this type of allergy. As a physician, I learned all about allergy and immunology when I studied medicine. They didn't talk about people allergic to alcohol. But Silkworth talked about allergy as this definition, any sort of an abnormal reaction to alcohol. And the gentleman who spoke at the beginning of my talk said, why do you drink to get a buzz? Here's what we're talking about. This is what he's talking about. I don't know who spoke up, but that is not the normal reaction to alcohol. Non-alcoholics do not get or drink to get a buzz. Uh, the brain's design has a lot to do with that. The brain we think is a real elegant object, it's really not. Uh, the, the brain is what's called a kludge. <laughs> it's uh, Jackson Granholm called a kludge. It's a, it's a mis it's, it's, it's a, a, an ill-assorted collection of poorly matched parts forming a distressing whole. We have a, and our, our brains are composed of a deep brain, a limbic system, and a cortex. They don't work very well. They don't play together very well. This part of the brain is where alcoholism and other appetites and rewards are centered, deep in the brain. That's the part of the brain we share with lizards. So the part of the brain that's involved with alcoholism and addiction, one part of the brain that Silkworth was talking about, well, he didn't know any of this biology, but he knew nothing about this, but he had it right dead on the head, dead on the nail. He said, the median forebrain bundle is where addiction lives, deep in the brain. That's the part of the brain you and I share with lizards. It's the part that determines our appetites and our rewards. And so people with alcoholism and other addictions have a dysregulation, an abnormality in this reward system such that they get an <coughs> abnormal reward from certain things. Now, for certain things are rewarding to everyone. Uh, food, water, sex, these things are rewarding to just about everyone because if we didn't get rewarded, we wouldn't do them. We wouldn't reproduce, we wouldn't eat, etc., etc. Alcohol in many individuals, about 11% of us, becomes ultimately a very, very rewarding experience. That's when someone says, I drink to get a buzz, that's what they're talking about. Uh, this is accompanied by a, a part of the brain that interprets that feeling and a part of that brain that wants more. This is the, corner, this is the prefrontal cortex where we have decision making and uh, ability to control ourselves. This gets a little bit distorted based on this down here. Long story short. I want to I urge you and advise you to come back and hear Dr. Christensen. He's going to expand on this for about another hour about the biology of what's really going on down here. It's fascinating. So certain parts of the brain will become uh, abnormally stimulated by cocaine, heroin, alcohol, and, and alcohol, these deep brain structures. Again, leading to control of this part of the brain, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So this is a complicated slide. Don't, don't get discouraged about this. But there are brain mechanisms that are affected by drugs and alcohol that influence behavior, which again, the environment goes back and forth with the behavior and the brain mechanisms. So these mechanisms in the brain uh, influence the behavior of certain people who are prone to this, who are susceptible. That's what he's talking about when he says allergy. So, what's the allergy? What's the reaction we get that's abnormal? Well, we get drunk. Non-alcoholics don't get drunk all the time because they don't like it. They don't like the feeling. They get sick all the time. Alcoholics get sick and they get in all kinds of trouble. 
Social drinkers don't get drunk, they don't get sick, they don't get in all kinds of trouble. They may do it once or twice, but they don't do it all their lives. So people who have this allergy behave completely differently than people who don't. They're, and Silver said they're in a class by themselves. This class is characterized by a craving for alcohol. He called that the allergy, the craving. Now, he never defined what he meant by craving. And if you're not an alcoholic, you'll never understand what people with alcoholism take for granted. You'll never understand it. And people who are alcoholic can't understand what it's like to stop at one drink or two drinks. But non-alcoholics will tell me, and I've talked to a whole bunch of them in my career, after two or three drinks, I get tipsy, nauseated, and I feel like I'm going out of control, and I quit drinking because I don't like that feeling. And the people with alcoholism hear that and say, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's what I like to drink, right? Um, if, I, if you've ever been at a party, if you're an alcoholic in this room, if you've been at a party and someone had two drinks and they said, you ask them if they want any more, and say, oh no, I don't want any more, I'm starting to feel it. You ever heard that? <laughs> <laughs> starting to feel it. That's what you want. Well, non-alcoholics don't like to feel it. Alcoholics like to feel it. That's why we're in this room. All right, the only, and so forth, this is a quote from the doctor's opinion, the only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. And this throws, this throws the wet blanket on alcoholism for time immemorial. Because Dr. Silkworth made that statement in his opinion, the only treatment for alcoholism is entire abstinence. So these allergic types can't drink alcohol safely in any form, whatever, any form. That means in beer, liquor, wine, cooking sherry, uh, NyQuil, all of them, you can't drink alcohol safely in any form. And this, you know, he said this almost 80 years ago, and that's pretty much the medical opinion on alcoholism today, that people who are truly alcoholic can't drink alcohol in any form, safely, whatever. Despite the years of attempting doctors and psychiatrists attempting to help alcoholics drink socially. And the book again says again and again, science may someday accomplish this, turning an alcoholic into a social drinker, hasn't done so yet. Anybody here become an alcoholic and try to drink socially? How'd it go? You know, <laughs> not so well. All right. So if you read the doctor's opinion, he'll say entire abstinence then is, 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 the, is the, the, the foundation stone of treating alcoholism. So uh, you can't start drinking because entire abstinence is required. So you can't start drinking. So if you're an alcoholic who's coming out of jail, coming out of the treatment center, coming out of the divorce court, and you've been sober for a week, a month, 90 days, you can't start drinking again because you will trigger this allergy leading to drug, sick, trouble. And as Silkworth describes it, the well-known stages of a spree. He talks about it in the doctor's opinion, the well-known stages of a spree. So what about alcohol and carrots? What am I talking about? Alcohol versus carrots, what do I mean by that? Those are carrots, and you all know what alcohol looks like. So if you are an alcoholic and you like carrots, raise your hand. I like carrots. And I'm an alcoholic. I like carrots. Now, if your doctor said tomorrow you can't have any more carrots, I'm sorry, you're all done with carrots, what do you say to that? I want more. <laughs> Only alcoholics would say that. Say, well, you have a life threatening condition that's, that's triggered by carrots, stop eating carrots. You'd say, all right, doc, I like carrots, but I'm going to give up carrots. I can make it even harder. Let's just say deep fried shrimp. I love deep fried shrimp. And I know some people with a shrimp allergy who have a seafood allergy, and you know, they, they eat one. They eat one deep fried shrimp, their lips swell, their face swells, their mouth choke closes off, and they end up in the ICU on a ventilator. That's, a, that's an iodine allergy, and they can't eat seafood in any form, whatever. They're allergic. I don't care how much you like deep fried shrimp. I don't know how many times you, want, you need to end up in a, on a ventilator in the ICU, probably about once, and you'd stop doing it. I've yet to see a meeting called Shrimp Eaters Anonymous. So, you know, <laughs> people who eat shrimp and are allergic, they don't say, I mean, if I switch from jumbo shrimp to small shrimp, I'll be okay. <laughs> No. Uh, maybe it's those people I eat shrimp with. I better find out. Maybe if I go to New Orleans and eat shrimp, I'll be off, better off than that. Well, my point is, is that the thinking around something like carrots or shrimp, even for an alcoholic, would be pretty normal. Pretty normal. If you can't drink, eat it, or drink it, you, you can't do it. And yet, normal individuals, they look at alcohol the way that I'm looking at carrots right now. So I take care of patients who are not alcoholic and they have blood pressure problems, they have medication problems, they have, they have, uh, they're on blood thinners. And I tell these patients, you can't drink the alcohol. And you know what they say? Okay. <laughs> and not only do they say okay, better yet, they stop drinking. 
And they come and see me six months later, and I ask, well, have you had a drink of alcohol? I said, of course not. You told me I couldn't drink. <laughs> For alcoholics, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, right. okay, right. It is pretty funny when you think about it. Have you had a drink? And they don't go to AA. They don't go to therapy. They don't go to treatment. I just said, quit drinking. And they say, oh, OK. And a year later, have you had a drink? No, you, Doc, you said don't drink. Now, so look at carrots and look at alcohol. So for the alcoholics, the non-alcoholics in this room are looking at alcohol the way you look at carrots. And for you non-alcoholics, uh, the alcoholics in this room cannot possibly look at alcohol the way that you look at alcohol for, the, for that reason, because their minds aren't right. And here's why. Addiction is not just a brain disease. What I've been talking about, when I said the kludge, we're talking about the deep brain. It's not just a brain disease, it's a mind disease. The alcoholic's mind is just as abnormal as his body, as it says in the doctor's opinion. And when Dr. Silver says the body, he means the brain, really, the deep brain structure. So the mind is just as abnormal. There's something wrong with the alcoholic's mind. As they say in Georgia, your mind ain't right if you're an alcoholic. <laughs> That's true. Can you identify with that? If you're a sober alcoholic, can you identify with how your mind wasn't right when it came to thinking about drinking? Uh, that's not what I'm, I'm that's the, the word obsession is the operative word here. That's what silk would use, obsession, not the perfume, but the process. is a compulsive preoccupation with a fixed idea. That's an obsession. Now you can be obsessed with a woman or a man, you can be obsessed with a, a political idea, or you can be obsessed with the idea that somehow, some way, I'm going to beat this game and drink like a gentleman, drink like a lady. That's the obsession that alcoholics have. Obsession is a form of thought, so we're talking about the mind, not the brain, but the mind. So we have a problem with the brain, which is an allergy, and a problem with the mind, which is an obsession. So we have people that are completely stone cold sober that think they can have one drink because they've been sober 90 days. That's an obsession, okay? They are restless, irritable, discontented, unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort. That's from the doctor's opinion. So Silkworth wrote this again almost 80 years ago. He said these folks are restless, irritable, and discontented. Now if you've been an alcoholic who's quit drinking but not gotten sober, you know exactly what he's talking about. Non-alcoholics, you have to take it on spec. Take my word for it. The people with this, once alcoholism or addiction is established, they are restless, irritable, and discontent when they quit drinking. If you're a non-alcoholic who's tried to quit smoking, you'll probably know what I'm talking about because you have a different form of addiction. But uh, non-alcoholics who had a smoking addiction who tried to just stop smoking get restless, irritable, and discontent. They're not nice to be around. I've been around a couple. Uh, how do we manage primitive drives? How do we manage the brain? The primitive parts of our brain control the less primitive parts. So, uh, believe it or not, you're not the master of your fate. <laughs> the primitive part of your brain controls your mind. Our basic drives change our thoughts. We are not rational beings. Anytime you want to test this out, put this to test, uh, is, is don't eat for a couple days and start driving around and look at billboards. You will quickly drive into the nearest fast food. I don't care what kind of diet you're on. You'll, move in, you'll, you'll start looking at food and get these environmental cues. You're, the deep part of your brain will tell you it's time to go get a, a, a double whopper with cheese, right. even though you're on a diet. Uh, I, anybody here trying to lose weight? <laughs> I'll raise my hand. <laughs> How's it going? Um, my wife had a cherry pie in the house last week, and uh, I'm, on a, I'm, not, I'm trying not to eat cherry pie. That cherry pie was sitting on the counter, and it was 9 o'clock at night last Wednesday night, and I didn't want to eat cherry pie. I didn't want to eat cherry pie. 8.30, I'm eating cherry pie. What's that all about? How does that work? I, I'm a pretty strong-willed individual, you know. Uh, I'm not a food addict. But my deep part of my brain said, go eat that piece of cherry pie. I wasn't able to sort of turn off my lizard brain. The part of the lizard part of my brain wanted me to eat cherry pie, and I did. As long as, as this part is in control of our thoughts, they will not change. In other words, you have to behave your way, live your way into sober living, into sober thinking, rather than to try to think your way into uh, sober living. You can't think your way out of addiction. So realize that the, the brain works from the bottom up. The top part of your brain, the cortex of your brain, neurologically speaking, does not control the lizard brain. That's why lizards, alligators don't come when you call them, by the way. <laughs> don't try that. Okay. Silkworth used this word insanity. Being unable to judge or comprehend the consequences of one's actions, that's a, a legal definition of insanity. So alcohol versus a hot stove. There's a hot stove, there's, that's me when I was about two and a half years old. Anybody, when you're a child, put your hand on a hot stove and get burned really, really bad? Uh, it's the last time you ever do that, by the way. I mean, all children, young, adults will learn, when you touch a real hot stove and get burned, you don't go back and do that. So what do alcoholics do? 
go back again and again and again and again. Alcoholics have been burned over and over and over and over again by their drinking, by the consequences of their drinking, uh, by their third, their fourth DUI. A good friend of mine has five DUIs. He's sober now. So how do you get five DUIs? By doing this again and again and again. So alcohol versus a hot stove. You, we're unable to learn uh, the, from the, from our previous mistakes, our previous bad consequences. That's that's why people die from addiction. They cannot bring it into their mind, not their brain, but their mind. So the brain is in control. The brain is in control, not the mind. So you can't stop starting. That's what that's what Silver was saying. You, you can't stop starting. So if you can't start start stopping, you can't stop starting. You are powerless over alcohol. You need a personality change sufficient to recover. So when you add up the allergy of the brain, the allergy of the body, plus the insanity and the obsession of the mind, you add these two things together, you become powerless over alcohol. And that's really what Bill Wilson told, uh, was told about when he was in his third treatment at Sounds Hospital. Silkworth said, you know, Bill, you're powerless over alcohol. You can't, you, you can't start drinking and you can't stop drinking. You're powerless over alcohol. So you can't start because of the allergy and you can't stop starting because of this obsession and this insanity. Now if that's the case, if you suffer from that problem, you're going to die from that because you are, you're, bound and you're, you're just bound to keep doing this over and over and over again. Knowledge doesn't fix this, good character doesn't fix this, uh, willpower doesn't fix this, you can't fix this. This is, this is what it means to be powerless. So stone cold sober, you'll start drinking again. So this is what Silver conceptualized in 1934 and this is how we understand the cycle of addiction today. People will take one drink after being sober, triggering their allergy. They go off on the well-known stages of a tree, they get drunk, sick, and in all kinds of trouble. They get sober because they end up in jail or the divorce court or they wake up uh, and they have a firm resolve. I'm not going to do this again. That's the alcoholic's national anthem. Come through forever, right? They become restless, irritable, and discontent after a while. It might be a week, it might be 30 days, it might be 90 days. Then this old insanity kicks in once again. They say, well, let me I'll have one drink, just one drink. Anybody who suffered from this illness can recognize themselves here. If you suffer from alcoholism, like as the big book would say, a real alcoholic, this is what you're suffering from. This cycle will go around and around. Silver says, unless they, uh, unless they, they will give a die or go insane, unless somehow they develop a personality change. So this is, by the way, this is a more recent publication. Uh, this was that. This is Silver's conceptualization from about 80 years ago. This is a more recent publication, which talks about the abnormality and reward circuits top-down control, frontal cortex, anterior cingulate prefrontal cortex, reward circuits. This is, this is neurologic jargon, but basically saying the same thing. And if you come back and hear Dr. Christensen, he's going to expand on this for about another hour, okay? So this is the end result of alcoholism right here. This is where it ends up, right here. You can't get out of it. So what happens? This who's anyone know who that is? Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob. Now, Dr. Bob and I have a couple things in common. We both uh, went to the University of Michigan, we're both physicians, and that's where the resemblance ends. <laughs> Nothing else about us is in common because, well, Dr. Bob uh, was six foot four, and you can tell I'm not six foot four. Dr. Bob is from Vermont, and I'm not. Dr. Bob is a humble man. I've never been accused of that particular virtue. Uh, and Dr. Bob is a man of few words, and as you can tell already, I'm not a, I may not have much to say, but I can take a long time in saying it. So, a lot of difference. So, Dr. Bob uh, was a medical student here when he was kicked out. He was an acting surgeon, co founder treated 5,000 alcoholics. His current AA membership is 2.8, actually 3 million now. 24 million copies of the Alcoholics Anonymous book sold since 1939. That's the book. Step one is in the book from Dr. Silkworth, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Hopeless, helpless, incurable. That's what we got from Dr. Silkworth. That's why Dr. Silkworth, who died, by the way, three months before I was born, uh, is, is, a, uh, is a considered a hero in AA because he gave Bill Wilson step one. That's Silkworth. That's where the step one came from Silkworth. Now, step two came to believe, if you remember what step two said, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could do what? Restore, restore us to sanity. Because obviously we suffer from insanity, we need to be restored from that insanity. No human power can do this. God could and would if he were sought. That's the spiritual foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous. A simple spiritual idea, which is step two. Now, that idea of step two did not come from Silkworth. He did not know the solution. I told you that Dr. Silkworth treated 40,000 alcoholics. He did not know what the solution to alcoholism was. He knew what the problem was. These men are powerless over alcohol, but he himself as a physician felt his own inadequacy, his own powerlessness, 
he couldn't help them very much at all. That's why he wrote that letter, because he was so impressed when Bill Wilson and 30 others had recovered from this hopeless condition of mind and body. And so the second step came from this man, psychiatrist Carl Jung. Carl Jung knew what the solution was. He had treated some alcoholics, and he came to believe, as really one of the major psychiatric practitioners in the Western world, that something like a spiritual experience, of, he called it a vital spiritual experience, was needed to overcome something like alcoholism. And, he, that, and, and Jung knew this, and he tried to tell other alcoholics this. But see, Jung knew the solution, but he didn't know what the problem was. He didn't know about powerlessness over alcohol. He just knew these alcoholics were somehow abnormal. There's something wrong with these folks. They can't stay drunk and they can't stay sober. But he didn't know what the solution was. I mean, he didn't know what the problem was. He knew what the solution was. So the second step came from Carl Jung. So the actions which bring about the solution came from a little group of individuals called the Oxford group. And the individuals, the, the actions are, well, that's not an action, but don't drink. Entire abstinence, go to meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps, prayer, one day at a time. These actions came via the Oxford groups at the time. And this guy, who's that, obviously? Bill W. That's Bill Wilson, the other co-founder that was described in the doctor's opinion. This man is the first human in history to have all three things at once. He had the problem from Dr. Silkworth. He had the solution from a man named Roland H. who came to see him. Now Roland H. got the solution from a guy who got the solution from Carl Jung. So Roland uh, and Ebby Thatcher came to see Bill Wilson with the solution. Uh, and Bill Wilson had this practical program of action because he'd been involved in, these, in something called the Oxford groups. So he had the action steps, he had the problem, he had the solution. And he was the first man really to recover in, with what we now call know as the 12 steps. So uh, this is the last page of the big book which says, abandon yourself to God as you understand him. And that happens in steps one, two, and three. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. That's steps four, five, six, and seven. Clear away the wreckage of your past. That's steps eight and nine as we understand them. And that's your freely what you find and join us at step 12. And that's the end of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And so Bill Wilson was the first individual to have this happen to him. And he saw that he had to give it to someone else in order to stay sober. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I've got time for questions. The boy came out on time. Great. So if there are any questions, we can now, I'll entertain you. Thank you.